got everybody here, so I'll call the meeting to order. Was Donna gonna uh, zoom in or? Yes, she is. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Are there any uh, changes or additions to the agenda as presented? Hearing none. You have nothing, Brian? Dad? Brian, you don't have anything to add? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes of March 6? So moved. Your motion, we got a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Rosemary, you got the floor. Okay, on the budget status report, I'll email those out to you guys tomorrow. On current taxes, um, we have about 1% higher collected than last year and about 1% less than the year before. So we're pretty well on track. But we've, I've noticed the last few weeks payments have slowed way down. Yeah. Of course, taxes are due on the 10th, so it's, start, it's starting to pick up right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the transfer on the Goss trailer happened. Um, it's all been recorded, and I guess they've moved into the into the trailer. And to date, we've issued about 190 dog tags, and loser we issue about 420. Would you like us to um, send out a reminder notices without any penalties? The penalty, the last we voted was they wouldn't be collected until after May, May 1st, 1st, right? What's Ford's pleasure? You want to extend it again, or you want to ex send it? Like extend it and do some paper the postage. Well, I think we're going to have to send a reminder whenever we do. We're have, I expect we're going to have to send at least one letter out okay. whenever we do start to want to collect. All right, fine with me. So, what's the board's pleasure? Is there any reason with regard to? Um, um, the um, immunization records that we want people coming in and, and checking those type of things, you know, their rabies. Um, we do want people to come in. Uh, much for that reason that, uh, you know, without a pretty extensive record search, we're not sure whose rabies certificates are going to expire this year and which will be uh, future years. And for animal care, they're still able to get rabies shots for animals, right? I would assume so. They're, the clinics were suspended for a little while. Um, I'm not sure what the status is right now. The last time I drove through Hyde Park, it looked like that place was open for business as usual. So, Yeah, I think because it's doing curb stop, curbside dog care. Dog care. So yeah. they are able to get rabies shots because they wouldn't be able to register the dog if it didn't have a shot. Right. So what, again, what's the board's pleasure? Do you want to extend another month or do you want to have letters sent out? Well, <laughs> if I may speak, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, uh, Mike. It's, it's no real big deal uh, to, to drop off the money uh, in an envelope in the drop box. Uh, People have their dogs. Uh, they know they have to be uh, licensed every year. And uh, one extension, one month extension, I would think would be enough. So are you so moving? Yes. That, that a letter be sent out reminding them May 1st? Yes. So what are we sending a letter to, to everyone that's registered a dog in the past or to everyone? All everyone? those who haven't completed their registration this year. But we don't. Uh, my oh. recommendation is just what you suggested, Matt, of the sending notice to everybody who has a dog, has had a dog in the past who has not registered yet this year. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's about 400 letters, Rosemary? Probably about 250. Does the office staff have that capacity to do that at this point? Yes. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? 
All those in favor sig signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Anything else, Rosemary? Uh, the governor is now allowing real estate transactions to happen. So attorneys, are, they have to make an appointment and only one person at a time and they must wear a mask and gloves. Okay, and we'll so you're wash uh, down the state, uh, And we'll wash down the state stations every, after every person has used it. Okay. And I contacted our um, land records provider and they told me it would be eight weeks before they could um, install them online. Okay. And I pushed back a little bit and they said, well, because we already have a website mm -hmm. and it may, be up, may take six weeks. Well, that's probably beyond this pandemic. Well, let's hope so. Well, yeah. We'll have them ready for the next time it comes around. Yeah, for wave two. Because we have about 20 years of scanned images that they could look up online. Yeah. And to do a title search, it's 40 years they need. Okay. It's, uh, it's to the first deed that appears to be good outside of 40 years. So it's a 40 year minimum. Anything else? And we'll need to have a, a motion to allow Eric to sign the uh, warrants. Did everybody take the opportunity to review them? Rosemary sent them out to us. I've not had the opportunity. Me uh, but, you, but they need to be signed by when, Rosemary? Oh, anytime. Sometime well, this week. All right. Well, I'll make, I have a great deal of faith in Eric and Rosemary, and uh, I know that uh, Eric will scrutinize them and do well on our behalf. So I make that motion. Second. Got a motion, a second, authorizing the chair to sign the warrants. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Anything else, Rosemary? That's all. That's all. Anybody got any questions for Rosemary? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Brian, Krause, you're up. Good oh. to see you again. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Hello. <laughs> nice to be here. Nice to see you. Um, I don't know if you guys got a copy of my report or not. No, I did not. All right. Well, it's floating around somewhere. I do have a few things I wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to bring you guys up to speed on our salt usage and our sand usage. Our salt, we use 370 tons, which is 170 below our average. So we were doing fairly decent there. Sand, we used 4,500 yards, which is 500 yards below average. And over time, we are right at a thousand hours of worked overtime. Overtime that's been paid, which a thousand hours is right at what we wanted for our limit. Mm -hmm. uh, what's been paid is more like eight hours because quite a few guys take advantage of the comp time and they put their overtime in there and then they take time off in the winter, um, which has been helpful. So I'm not, so I'm going to ask for a little overtime if possible. I'm not concerned about getting through the rest of this year. Um, I have plenty to do, you know, any little storms or, you know, trees that need to be taken care of. I have plenty for that. But I'm more concerned about once we can start working, you know, start working again with a full staff, trying to get caught up. Because um, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be behind on quite a few things because we can't, you know, I'm working two guys now and we can only do what is most important. Right. Um, so, so in an ideal world, this pandemic goes, calms down and we can all get back to work. I would love to, to have the ability to, when I can, to work, you know, a little more overtime so I can try to get caught up with, you know, ditching and making gravel and, and whatnot. 
Brian's story, you might want to fill the whole board in on uh, what you learned with the COVID-19 reimbursement. Okay. Um, so uh, we've got a, an agenda item about this, but this is a pretty good time to start talking about it. Uh, most, uh, I've attended two of the FEMA pre-applicant briefings. Uh, and we've had some discussions with Ben Rose and Kim Kanareki about this. It appears that um, regular funds, uh, primarily funds that have already been allocated, so like our highway salary, um, is not going to be eligible for reimbursement, even though we are spending it on emergency related things in our eyes. Um, by having our highway crew stay home, um, that that does not appear to be the position that the federal government is taking for FEMA. So it looks like we will not get. Um, yeah, it looks like we're not going to get reimbursement through that program. I'm hoping that other programs will be available to us. I'm working with Karen Horn and. BLCP to try and uh, see what we can find and also reached out to uh, our federal representation um, to express how much we need some support as a municipality. Um, but as of right now, uh, we're not being reimbursed for those wages. Okay. Bye. I guess it's a good heads up. Uh, Brian may be coming to us for request and it may or may not be reimbursable. Just for everyone's awareness. Too bad we weren't a corporation. They give us billions of dollars with no strings attached. Yeah. So, question? Go ahead, Matt. So, current state is that we have uh, two workers on a shift right now? Two. That, that, is that is correct. Two plus, plus I've been coming in and filling in where necessary or working in my office in the shop. So can we have two two-person crews outgoing? That might work, I, hopefully with Governor Scott's, um, you know, the analogy he used was starting to loosen the the hose and you know the quarter turn so hopefully as that develops we can start engaging in a lot more practices right now we are restricted in what activities we can carry out to a degree that we don't really need more people working there's just so little that we're allowed to do uh, you've probably done a lot more reading on this than i have brian but from what I'm seeing, we sh what's the difference between having two people <laughs> on one side of town and two people on one side of town, and two people on the other side of town? Well, well that's that's nope. not the concern, Nat. It's we're not allowed to do beyond the emergency type of repairs. I believe. Well, yeah. All right, if you say so. But I I question that, and I think that needs to be looked into if it hasn't been. I mean, that's the last I heard too from uh, and what I've seen in, in uh, correspondence is that we are limited on what we're supposed to be doing. We're at, if a failed culvert happens, we can go out and replace it. Uh, emergency grading to prevent uh, for safety issues, we can do it. Uh, but just routine spring maintenance, we can't do it. Right, but you know, uh, the reason I question that is because uh, they he's loosened the restrictions on uh, like landscaping crews and things yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think they, that they have changed very recently. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that was effective today, but I wouldn't be surprised in another week or two, you're going to see another little loosening up. And I, I would guess our road crew will be fully able to work here shortly. May 1st, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I have a conference on a conference call on Wednesday with uh, the League of Cities and Towns, where we're going to get into some pretty great detail about what activities are permitted 
Good, good, okay. Because I know that there's been some modifications as of today. Um, I'd like to wait until Wednesday when I have opportunity to work with a few more experts uh, to really reevaluate what our act what our current actions are permitted to be. Um, but I do think that we're going to get I think we will be able to do more um, you know possibly this week or the next week or, or shortly after. Uh, and then during that time, it will also start to be worth, at some point, we'll have to have a serious conversation about bringing more people in at once as well, uh, when there's more kind of activity for them to engage in. So the, the um, I'm hearing, you know, it makes sense. Brian's got a need, Brian Crassley has a need for, for more overtime to do some catch up, um, but, that's going to be met with a real um, a real crunch for funds. I mean, we're just going to be slammed pretty hard by this. So it's not like we're just easily going to be able to find that overtime money. Exactly. Well, the, the sooner that that I can, you know, get more people in, the, the less the need will be. So, and, and I, like I was telling Brian, I can keep guys apart. I mean, I, we don't, I can, there's plenty to do, or I can have two people on this end of town and two people on the other end of town. That, but, that's my impression of the point, Brian. Yeah, so we're thinking alike there. But, I but think right Brian, now, we're not supposed to. Yeah. Brian, to the point of how much work we're going to be behind, you may want to start thinking about a prioritized list for us on what you may or may not be able to accomplish with or without overtime and how much overtime for each that we could start looking at when we can, when the spigot's fully turned on, when we can bring everybody in and we could work overtime if money was not an object, what do you have that needs to be done? Gotcha. Yeah. I can get a list right now. Right now we're really not doing too bad because I mean, last year this time we couldn't be working. It was, you know, snowing and raining and right. we were still in the winter. So, it's it's just sad that we have this weather and I can't take advantage of it. Right. So, you know, it, it, if if we can start working soon, you know, we're going to be okay, and I won't ask for a lot of overtime. But if this keeps dragging out, you know, longer and longer, the longer it goes, the worse things will be. Right. Well, hopefully, it won't be much longer. Yeah. Um, Brian. Um, yeah. Obviously not a, a, a pressing priority, but I noticed that Old Mill Park really needs a lot of help in terms of cleanup. There's a lot of wind-blown trees and blocking parts of the path, the walking path, and just a lot of debris. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that. We just opened the gate to allow cars in. Okay. Um, we were in there last week and we fenced the playground. Um, okay. Yeah. Field playground, but I haven't I haven't looked at the trail. Yeah, it's it's parts of it are okay, but a large swaths of it are are um, covered in lot, big branches and trees and um, and then Lisa, I also wanted to mention to you that there's just a lot of like um, actually there's a whole goalpost that probably the wind carried it all the way down into the ditch, <laughs> so. Um, so there's just, there's just, you know, there's just stuff floating around everywhere. And um, so just, I know it's not a huge priority, but I just wanted you to be aware of it. Okay. And that's probably one of those things that they don't want us working on because it's not an emergency. Right. I realize that. But, right. But if I do get a chance and they got, and I got a couple guys in there, we can go over and do, you know, see what we can do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just mentioned it because it's one place that we can walk pretty safely without running into a ton of people <laughs> and all at the right. same time. Yeah. Thank you. There's, a, there's a little bit of debris down at the skate park too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <a> there is. <laughs> that guy's quite a start, isn't it? Okay, anything else for Brian or do you have anything else, Brian? I do. Um, my last item on here was the utility tractor for mowing and shoulder reclaiming and picking up 
trees and debris. Um, I got a couple quotes. I was going, and you probably don't have them either, um, but I wanted to recommend going with uh, a tractor from Pete's Equipment in Morrisville with a broom and uh, a four in one bucket for debris cleanup. And for some of these ash trees we're gonna start cutting, it'd be certainly nice to have it looking into mm -hmm. the future. Um, it's a decent tractor. Uh, it's, we save quite a bit of money as from going with like Kubota. Um, and I think, I think for what we want, I, I think it's, it's fine and we can keep, you know, we buy it local, which is nice and we can keep some of the business in the, the county. Was that a Coyote? Yes. Do you have a, are you just uh, going out for bids or do you have any? I have, I had several quotes. Um, John Deere wasn't really interested in quote me a broom and we do need a broom. We're, we're going right. to be needing a broom next year. We need a broom this year. Um, so they, they're kind of out of the picture. So it was Kubota and, and Coyote. Kubota without a four in one bucket, but with the broom and the, and the loader, it, um, it comes in at, like 83,500 and the coyote with, with the broom the loader, uh, it comes in a four in one bucket, which is, which is, which is really nice to have on a tractor, on a utility tractor and the way we're going to use it comes in at 78, five. Yeah. And Pete, um, Pete's equipment, they have one in stock. They can have it to us in a week, maybe two weeks and they're willing to, you know, to deliver it without taking payment until the first of, you know, be the beginning of July when the money is available for that track, for that purchase, which is nice because right now is a good time of the year when things aren't growing real good to start reclaiming these shoulders. And before, you know, the vegetation gets thick and, and growing really good. Right. Rosemary, how do you feel about writing out a check July 1st for 78000 Hundred. Uh, Seventy-eight. Seventy-eight thousand. Seventy-eight thousand. Yeah. Thousand, yeah. I I the money from the bank. Beg your pardon. <laughs> it's a slightly bigger tractor you're looking at than I realized. <laughs> I have a question for uh, Brian Crosby. Yeah. So wait a minute. What What did Rosemary say? I didn't hear. It's fine as long as we borrow the money from the bank. Okay. Uh, I did a quick calculation on borrowing the money. On. Uh, and it looks like it will come in a little under uh, 85,000 with interest over five years. Okay. Uh, which is $15,000 less than the 100,000 we had budgeted uh, as our, you know, max out 10 uh, for this. So that will leave our equipment funds uh, pretty healthy. Good, good. Go ahead, Mike. Are you, uh, Brian, are you happy with this tractor versus a Kubota? From what I've heard, I'm happy. Um, I don't think the quality is, you know, as good as a Kubota, but I think for what we use it for, I've heard plenty, plenty of people that have had them for a long time and say nothing but good things about them. I, I think for what we're going to use it for, I think it'll be fine. Essex equipment seems to give a little bit better breakdown of what you getting for the money here uh there's no way to kind of tweak them a little bit in essex equipment i you mean trying to try to get them down a little bit you mean yeah i could i don't know i mean they're, they're both good tractors but i think kubota has a much better track record and uh everybody and their brother swears by a Kubota tractor. You know, granted, we would be buying local, but I really think a Kubota is a better tractor. Well, I think it's a little better tractor too. I don't think there's anything wrong with Coyote. Um, I think the price reflects, you know, the little bit better quality. But like I said, for, for the amount we use it, I, d I don't see any issues at all. All right, well. Oh, Brian, this is uh, Ed Raymond. What, what kind of coyote is it? What, uh, what's the horsepower? What did they say? Yeah. It's a, it's a
the PX 115. It's 110 horsepower. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's quite a bit bigger than the one I have of theirs. Mine's a 7320. But I haven't had any problems with mine. It's been a good tractor. Yeah, I've, I've talked to a couple people that have had them, and yeah, they're all happy with them. Well, let me have that. What's, uh, what's the board's pleasure? We're talking about a $4,500 difference. Uh, a recommendation from our form is the uh, well, 785. If, if I may, Eric. It's, yeah, go ahead, Brian. It's not just a, it's not just that difference. Um, with the Coyote, you're getting a four-in-one bucket. With the Gabota, that price doesn't reflect a four-in-one bucket, which okay. I don't know that we could afford one if I if I go with the Kubota or not. But I think we're getting utility tractor for mowing and shoulder and 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 tree cleanup. I I think we we need to spend the money to get a four-in-one bucket. So that that price, it, it's not. You know, it's not fair to say that it's just that, you know, the $4,000 difference. It's, it's more like eight because you got that bucket figured in there as well. I understand, yeah. Yeah. Go with the one from B. Are you moving? Yes. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a second. Any more discussion? All those in favor, sing five, sing aye. Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Anything else, Brian? Um, that's it for me, unless you have questions for me. Anybody got any questions for Brian? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I've got a little heads up for the board. Uh, based on conversation that Brian and I had today uh, about the new right-of-way access policy and permit. Uh, we think that there's gonna be a couple changes to the permit itself that we'd like to make. So the board is gonna see that again um, next month or so uh, with just some, clean up some language, it still says road foreman in a couple spots and uh, there's, there's just some minor tweaks that we wanna make on it. Just a heads up. You'll see okay. it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess if you're ready, go into your report. And I believe Jill is with us tonight. Hi there, this is Jill from the property valuation review. Is that the Jill you were looking for? That's the Jill we're looking for. Uh, maybe Brian, you wanna open it up and then we'll uh, ask Jill for some input here. Okay. <clears throat> So, see, our first item here is going to be a discussion about kind of the board's uh, sorry, this is the board's concerns about how to handle uh, reappraisal right now. And I, I think that a lot of this gets in a uh, philosophical concern also. We, we've been told by uh, our Nemric and Jill at the state that we have permission uh, to do the reappraisal and to handle the disputes uh, and we're, they're making accommodations for us to be able to handle disputes and handle inspections uh, but it's kind of philosophically is it still fair for us to do this or not. Um, and the board's been kind of wrestling with that question a little bit of, do we feel comfortable taking advantage of the accommodations that we have available to us uh, to complete the reappraisal? Uh, and I think that there are probably more concerns and uh, more that we want to discuss now that we're facing news about uh, NVU and, and what's happening there. So. Uh, that's kind of where we're at. Um, now is there, do those, any of the board members want to open up or do you want a, uh, a kind of a recommendation or a deeper summary from me? 
why don't I uh, why don't I start since I've been been pushing this if I could go ahead Doug. And, and and I don't have a position I, I just have uh, I guess you know, COVID-19 fears I was worried about the obligation of our um, folks who from who would be going out and looking at the property I was worried about the workload of of the the select board for the hearings that are upcoming and I'm worried uh, in terms of NEMRIC in terms of our our contract you know are, are we really need to go go forward with it because it's absolutely necessary and, and no matter what's happening uh, um, what what the reasons would be not to go ahead should we go ahead in any event with it it certainly was Jill's recommendation that, that we go ahead with it and I suspect that that that's Robin's too um, I'd like to ask what the what the process is for here what the time scheduling is what what Robin sees in in and Jill has made clear to me she is very gracious to to sign in uh, on her time. Uh, I appreciate that, and I, I made a nuisance of myself by sending out a, a letter to her, and and, she, and I appreciate her being here. Um, so, from Robin, I'm I'm wondering about what's the time frame? What do you do? When does it happen? What happens after that? I think you want to hear from Ed, who should be on. Um, the project is underway. All the interior inspections that were available have been done. We actually are wrapping all of this up. Our site visits have been done. We are just doing, um, sales review has been done. We're pretty much ready to go. We just have some loose odds and ends, which is typical for grand list maintenance. It, Robin, um, I just, how do we, I guess so I, I hear some of what Doug is saying, the concerns that we have with, okay, uh, somebody wants to contest their assessment. First of all, it'll go to you. Uh, if they're not happy with your outcome, it'll, they'll appeal it to the BCA. Uh, we can handle a BCA hearing in a format very similar to this. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the requirement to, of three members to go out and view the property, um, if if the timetable that would drive this would not be until like August, then maybe it's no longer a, a huge issue. If the timetable was uh, within three weeks of right now, we'd have a big concern about putting people out there on properties um, with the possibility of a lot lot of appeals so what one is what is the timetable and how would we manage the uh, the issue of doing site visits if it's still in the middle of a pandemic if I jump in here yes go ahead this is Ed Claude Felter I'm the senior appraiser for, for memory and uh, we really aren't scheduled to, to start hearings until like sometime the first part of June okay so we're we're a ways off from, from really um, getting those notices out. And so then you're talking, you know, after June, you're not talking about any BCA potential until sometime in August. In fact, I'm hoping that it would be a, a tough call to determine what would be able to actually do some reasonable um, hearings with people. I mean, we've got a process set up um, by the time we get to doing this in Johnson, it'll be, we'll be pretty experienced at it in terms of, you know, you're going to send the, the notices out. People will be able to, um, they have to do a written response for a formal grievance. We're going to have pre-hearings as well, have a chance to talk with people over the phone or do a hangout like we're doing with this, uh, go over what their questions are, uh, answer those questions. Um, then we'll have the formal you know, set of grievances and they have to be written anyway and again the same process we could either do them over the phone they don't have to be present at a grievance hearing they can just do what their written response is we'll certainly take into consideration the things that they that they present to us that are their concerns for things that we need to go out and drive by and look at we can um, do we have to do serious interior inspections on a lot of those places probably not uh, so I don't I think the concern for that portion of it really is not is, is not real serious. It doesn't concern me at all. 
And I'm frankly hoping that by the time we get to BCA, then I don't think they'll have a, I don't you know how, what the numbers are gonna be. Typically we don't have a lot of BCA, but there are gonna be some obviously, but I don't think you're looking at those until probably sometime in August to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's good to know. So what percentage uh, would you, as a guesstimate, think of the, uh, um, of the people who grieve would be asking for BCA? Is, is there some history to this? You know, we, we typically have about 5% oh, of pre-hearings and then maybe another 5% of that. Um, and then, you know, after that, it really just kind of depends on what they are. All I can tell you is that last year in Middlebury, we had like a dozen. We did Woodstock two, three years ago. We had 14, and the most of those were current use. Uh, we just don't have a lot of those, to tell you the truth. Because um, I, I, I think because we take our time and we really, you know, we've, we've completed a sales review and we just completed a field review. We drove by a lot of places and looked at stuff and made sure that they were, were equitable and that they made sense relative to the sales. And now we're gonna do one more paper review and we'll find what the outliers are and we'll take a look at those again and make sure that they make sense. Are they justified? You know, is there an, a new garage here? Or was, this, was this undervalued before? Was the great adjustment wrong on that? And try to, so we can justify to ourselves what those differences might be. So. We're going through three layers of a review before we put stuff out. And I think it reflects in the fact that we just don't have a lot of a overall appeal to tell you the truth, but that's just, that's just my opinion. And I would sort of echo what you're saying, Ed, in the past when we've had uh, reappraisals, uh, the vast majority of them were resolved at the listers level when we had listers and I don't know if Rosemary can recall about how many went to the BCA level, but it was a fraction of the original ones that start appealing. I would say it was less than a dozen. Yeah, okay. So maybe it's a fair assumption that we could be looking at 10, 15, something in that range. You know, I like your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it's really, you never, you can never say, you, you, you yeah. always, you, you do the best you can. And I'm, I agree with you. That's why we had that pre-hearing process. Well, most of the time, people just have a question. Mm -hmm. and, and if you answer those questions, then they're fine with that. Um, every, and what I found is that the things that come before agreements a lot of times, there are things that really need to be brought to our attention. And maybe we just miss something. Maybe there's something we don't know about a property. Maybe there's, you know, who knows, but there's usually a good reason at once you get to that point, once you get by those, those pre-hearings and answer all those questions, uh, sometimes you just get people who just don't agree and that's, that's fine. And that's, you know, you present information at that point in time and say, here's, here's the sales we've looked at and here's what they show, you, you know, here's some information for you to make your determination with, with as well. So all you can do is, is try to be as thorough and as fair and informative as you can be. That's all you can do. Now, uh, if a bunch of people, let's say, uh, you know, this whole NVU thing, uh, we don't know what's gonna happen here, and uh, they decide to pull out of Johnson and, and shut down the college, and people have concerns with their, uh, you know, what the value of their house is, and a lot of people, look at the market value and don't always correlate that an assessed value doesn't necessarily agree with the market rate. And when there is that discrepancy, the CLA makes the adjustment. Now, if, if the college did you know, shut down and next year, a year from now, the market was showing a significant downturn in what the value of homes are in Johnson, the CLA would take that into account and where we, our state education tax would be reflected in that. That would be true. Yeah. But I, I, I've been thinking about this a little bit when I first heard this announcement that I'm pretty sad about. I've refereed, refereed a lot of basketball games at Johnson State over the last 25 years. I, 
I'm pretty comfortable up there. I would be sad if they're gone. Um, and Lyndon as well. Um, but we really aren't going to know the impact of that probably for a year or two in terms of how it's going to affect the market with things. Um, so we, we, we need to put ourselves in a position where we can respond quickly if we need to. And I can tell you is that there really is, is it's, there's really no going back to the old files at this point in time. Um, we're a year beyond we've even touched those things. And so what we're going to have when the reappraisal is completed is we're going to have a really nice, clean, solid, new set of data that you're going to have a common level that's going to be, you know, right up to market values. And so if we had to come along in two years and adjust that, we need to have good data. And if Jill's still listening, she can back in with it, talk about this as well. But at that point in time, if you've got good data, you can respond pretty quickly with an update. A statistical update and you can do that for you know the cost is, is half what it costs to do a reappraisal um, and you can respond within a year's time frame very quickly and get that done so i think the best scenario for the town is to get this in place and prepare for what could happen and then maybe nothing will happen uh just a quick side thing uh, i ran into one of my attorney friends who's uh, a real estate agent, a real estate attorney in the area here. So this is central Vermont. I live in Calais. And uh, she says she's just about as busy as she can be. Um, so there is a lot of pent up demand and she doesn't see that there's had that the COVID things having a huge impact, especially when Rosemary starts letting people back in the office to do their title work, whenever that's going to happen, uh, that's going to move things along there. So I, I'm not sure what the COVID impact is going to be to tell you the truth. I think the NVU thing will be something we'll have to consider, you know, but I think we're looking two years down the road. Okay, thank you. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, if you have this good information at this point, what would be the disadvantage in waiting to uh, see the sales next year, how it's been affecting the value? of the of the property if or if you know we would know next year whether or not whether or not uh, nvu closes or stays you need to you need to keep the data going you need to keep the data updated as much as possible so you can really that's how you really monitor what things are doing you can't just take a year off and not and not see what the market's doing um I guess, how would, uh, what do you mean by taking a year off? I mean, you, I suppose, I, I assume that we have a contract with you and you may or may not have time to stay on top of the data or, you know, uh, and the contract clearly is what's for the quadrennial. I assume that there are costs and you might or might not have time to, to help us if we delay, you know, that was a possibility. That would be a good reason just to go ahead because, you folks have done it. You, I presume that you've done a really good job, and and uh, and maybe you roll it out. But uh, isn't it isn't it possible that uh, I understood somebody said that when Green Mountain College pulled out, real estate values went down by twenty percent. Uh, you know, are we going to be out of sync in in a year, or maybe and maybe not? Uh, it may not happen. You know, uh, so it's it's really a matter of of. So there's, there's, there's portions about keeping the, I talked about keeping the data current. So getting all the transfers in place, you know, having the, the basic information about each property, keep that as current as possible. And once you've got that done, what you're changing after, if the market were to change, you're changing the base set of calculations, the base set of tables, the land tables, depreciation, time location, cost tables, things along those lines. You aren't changing the data. You need to keep that current so you can can, re, can adjust the values accordingly, but the base tables are the things you're going to change. And what will you be doing differently with regard to the, the data and the base tables if you roll it out this year as opposed to next year? Well, this year would be the starting point. And if you, 
rolled it out next year, you would lose a year of data. So you wouldn't have that two years of, I guess I think it's gonna take two years to really determine the impact of that, um, if it's gonna be an impact. Um, and you, you, you really need to get the base established, get things out and then keep it up and monitor the changes that take place in the market. Because you can respond to the market easier than you can respond to a lot of little changes in individual properties. They aren't, they aren't gonna change the square footages and the quality grades and the, the year builds and those things are not gonna change uh, except for the new things. And the new stuff might be new construction or things that, that are, are updated or improved that you have to pick up along the way. Uh, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. My concern is, well, let me just ask one question to you. Was there an average of a percent, it was a percent average of what the value of uh, all the homes went up in Johnson during this reappraisal? We, we haven't looked at that yet. I guess my concern is if they was, let's say, I'm just gonna pick a number, 10%, and if you roll it out, and so everybody's home on an average is worth 10% more than what it was. And during this time frame, let's say by chance in a week, uh, with, even though we have so many people trying to stop the closure of our college, and let's say by chance it does happen, then you can pull the rug out from the value of our homes in this community at the present appraised value. So you got a chance of losing twice here. And then you've got also the chance of overpaying taxes. Well, it's as of April 1st. That, that, so what's happened after April 1st doesn't make any difference for the grand list for this year, for your tax well, I understand year. that. Uh, but we're, we are, uh, I just see a big scenario here of all of this trouble going on and people losing value and then having their homes in it a larger value than what they're actually worth and then trying to correct this, this can turn into a big problem, I think. Yeah, well, your common level last year was about 93%. So they've already added 7% to your tax rate to, to make for that adjustment. Um, you know, so if we're looking at being around 100%, um, it'd have to be a pretty significant drop to have an impact, I would think. Okay. Because the state's gonna adjust that grant that Using last year's number, they would have to adjust that old grand list by, by you know, basically 7% upward to equalize the values, what they'd have to do. So that, that portion is going to happen sort of regardless. Okay. And then you do that with, and you do that when you have built in inequity. So let's say, let's say, for example, let's just talk about the unlanded mobile homes in the park. So your, your common level there was anywhere between your aggregate ratio was 8% high, but your, your, overall, your overall common level was 93% of market value, but your, but your mobile home and landed category was 8% high. So well, there's a pretty big disparity right there. And I, I can tell you that, that, that the mobile, um, unlanded mobile homes are not gonna go up, you know, the 7% from the 93% common level, they're gonna come down. So you've, if you just take a, an adjustment upwards or using the common level, you've built the, the inequities is maintained and continues. Thank you. Say, so Ed, I'm wondering, do you think that if, if the college pulls out the values of different kinds of property would be, you know, say you've got uh, timberland, farmland, primary residence, secondary homes, you know, is, is the effect likely to be you know, uniform across the, the spectrum or is it, is it likely to be different? I think it's likely to be different. And I, I don't think it really affects um, a, a lot of those, especially the large tracts of land, they're, they're, they don't that didn't affect them really at all. Um, I, th I think your, your, the mobile home categories will not be um, affected in a downward sort of level too much. I, I can give you a little bit of experience. Um, I was the, uh, 
assessor and appraiser for the town of Brandon years ago when the train school went out. And the impact of that, I mean, a lot of people worked there. And the impact of that, it wasn't really across the town so much, but in that case, what it affected was, was the, the second, was the apartment market. Because people that worked at the training school, a lot of them had apartments that lived in Brandon. And there was an impact on that sort of quickly. And then over a period of, I'd say about, oh, three to five years, that sort of went away. But there was an impact on that group, grouping of properties at that point in time. And that's really the only experience I have. I've, I've been contacted by, by Pulteney, um, but they, they didn't seem worried about their value changes. They were mostly worried about how to value the college um, if that were to happen. So um, that was sort of a, didn't really have a market discussion with them. Okay, thank you. Anyone else got any questions? So we are, uh, having it at a point where we need to make a decision, uh, give the green light. Eric? Yes, go ahead, Scott. Um, if you don't mind, I just got off the Zoom call with the board uh, for the college. My understanding is on the 27th, they're going to reconvene and take a vote. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if it would be prudent to see what their action is going to be instead of trying to guess what their action is gonna be. And quite frankly, um, my fingers are crossed. Some of the board members looked concerned and there was a lot of good questions that were posed. Unfortunately, there's probably three or four board members that seem to be dozing off and very disinterested, which was troubling to watch. But I'd be, be very self-conscious in this meeting. Yeah. Uh, um, they were I'm, tired, I think. I'll, I'll, I'll leave my personal comments on the side, but I'm just wondering if it wouldn't be worth just waiting to see. It's seven days away. Yeah, I like that idea. The only concern I have is I don't think it'll be over in seven days. Yeah. True, sure, but a vote's going to be taken in seven days. But I don't think it'll be, that'll be the end of it. Well, that's true, but at least we're going to have a better idea after that vote of, where, of what's going to happen. No, I think a lot of people are petitioning to have the vote come off the table altogether. Okay. But I guess to what Ed was saying, we could still roll out the uh, reappraisal and then do a statistical adjustment next year if we did come into that situation where the college is gone and we do see a uh, change in the market values, but it's going to be a year or two out, even if the college was to uh, cease to exist after June. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Is it a showstopper if we don't vote on this tonight? We need to either, I would say, pull this and Ed or Robin can probably correct me, Jill, uh, either give them the green light tonight or, or just uh, pull it completely because they need to start this whole process right off. Can we ask them what their next step is and when, when, whether or not waiting till the 27th would, would negatively affect them moving ahead? Yep. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, one of you if you want to speak to it. This is Jill. Did you folks want me to weigh in here? Sure. I don't want to be presumptuous. Yes, okay. go ahead. All right, thank you. So for those of you who don't know, um, I'm the Director of Property Evaluation Review at the Tax Department. And so um, I popped on here. Uh, you're not the only town that is in some stage of a reappraisal right now and in wondering what to do. Um, and, and I think Ed has done a phenomenal job of answering your questions and, and putting me, he's there even further along than I thought you folks were. I completely understand the concern about moving forward right now, but I think it's important to separate the two, the two issues and the two timelines. Uh, the fact that you folks are done with the actual, you know, physical inspection piece of the reappraisal and that what they're doing right now is the, is the analysis um, is one major check in the market continuing on. Second, um, as Ed pointed out, 
you know, it's as of April 1st and you, you can't hold off on, uh, on, you know, filing your reappraised grand list on an unknown future. And that's actually what a huge part of what our staff does every year is the equalization study, which sets that CLA, which adjusts the tax rates based on what the market's doing. So there is, there is a room for that calibration in state law for, you know, just this kind of reason. I, I don't see any benefit to your community or yourselves in holding off just because you're so far along already. And, um, and I don't think frankly that next year will be any fewer um, concerns or any, you know, any, any more certainty. So I just think it's really important to, to kind of separate the two issues. I, I agree that seven days from now, regardless of what the board does, that, that really probably shouldn't change your mind about the reappraisal. I don't think that, uh, that waiting when you've already got the data collected um, is going to get you folks where you need to go. And certainly we in the league have done what we can to publish guidance for towns on how to handle the grievance process. Uh, of course, people are going to be concerned and they may grieve at a higher level. Um, I don't think that would be any different next year either. In fact, it might be worse. Um, it's also important to remember that the, you know, 70% of them. So there are pieces in the state law that calibrate for that as well. So it's my long winded way of saying, I think that you're in good hands and you're in a good position and that I, I don't see my recommendation certainly would be to continue, um, and finalize your reappraisal. Obviously I certainly don't have any authority to tell you folks what to do, but I appreciate you letting us call in and, and follow along and I, I absolutely respect and understand the difficult position you're in. And uh, I want to do whatever I can to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. I appreciate that advice. I think we should follow it. Yeah. I move that we move forward. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Um, can I just get clarity on what moving forward means exactly? my first time through this. Uh, I guess I'm going to go back to Kyle. Is your motion to give the green light for rolling out the real uh, reappraisal? Yes. Yes. So moving forward as we normally would. Uh, strictly speaking, you don't necessarily have to have a motion okay. to do anything. Um, Just let it go. Yeah. Okay. okay. As long as we don't stop it, this is already in motion and working its way through. Is there any board member who wants to stop this process? I don't want to stop it. I think I want to know what what would happen by the 27th if we didn't say anything, you know, and, and we we're presuming letting it go, um, you know. What happens between now and the, and the 28th? We're going to continue to work. <laughs> nothing, nothing that would change right. our minds one way or the other. It, it, it doesn't affect us at all. Okay. But they were saying it wouldn't, it really wouldn't, you know, again, separating the two issues. Like it really wouldn't, um, necessarily make us want to wait even if the board decides to you know close the campuses I don't know it'd make a difference to me I if I can weigh in here I think it's important to distinguish it's true that uh, the reappraisal will likely have raised property values for quite a few people but it's in most important feature to us is that it's more accurate, that it better represents the, the current state of, of Johnson. If that changes for any reason, uh, as a response to the pandemic or the college or, or any reason, that change could be applied to bad data that we have right now that's old and out of date or that change could happen to current accurate data. And if that change happens to the current accurate data, we're in a better position to manage it in the future with uh, statistical change or uh, speeding up uh, our next reappraisal or, or whatever we do. 
Uh, my recommendation for this is that we go ahead with the current reappraisal and then start talking about what are our options for the next reappraisal and for you know statistical changes or whatever else we want to do in the future. Uh, but right now, anything that we're working on is working on bad debt. Um, it's it's clear that our unlanded motor mobile homes are tremendously unfairly taxed on this, and there there are further other things. I agree with that. I think that if we were going to move to stop this, we'd have to ask uh, property valuation review for for permission to do that. I just think that uh, we don't take take any action, and I'm going to be watching the uh, uh, NVU uh, question. And even just to see, and I don't know how, based on what people have said, how that would enter into it, but I just give people a heads up that I'm going to be watching that. I know we're supposed to assess value as, as of April 1, but uh, I doubt we'll, I would ever vote to not proceed with this. But I just want to give people a heads up that uh, uh, the NVU thing may make a difference at some point to me. And I don't know how or why in, in light of what you said, but it seems like a big deal in, in, in our community's life. I, I would say, I think it is a big deal and I agree with you about that. But again, I just wanna point out to you that the, the old data is really not accessible. I mean, we, it would take us a lot of effort to have to try to go back. We, we just haven't touched it for more than a year. Uh, we've been working on the process of, of doing the reappraisal, keeping things current. Um, and so uh, the old database, as far as I'm concerned, is really not usable. It's, I'm just being real honest with you. I just want to make that clear. Yeah. When you're talking about the old database, you're talking about the database for the current grand list that we're working with, as opposed to the one that you're doing now? Yes. yes. Okay. You know, Jill, Jill had made a point in a letter to me that, that that uh, or an email to me that uh, you know stretching things out four years is, is is a long time too for data. You know, so so I you know I'm I'm with you on that, but I don't understand how we would lose our data if we delayed. I understand we'd be operating another year on what I consider to be an unfair system, an unfair allocation of value. So I, I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm caught by my insecurity of not of these major events. Uh, I think the pandemic is going to affect value. I don't know if it's positive or negative, and and I'm certain that uh, JSC and NVU leaving will affect value. But uh, you know, that's just I just have to make decisions in that area. But you guys are the experts, and I would tend to rely on you. But I'd like to see the information of what they do, and I don't think our if we do nothing right now, I would presume and hope that you would go full speed ahead. Hey, Doug, uh, we had done a townwide reappraisal just before the, the Great Recession there in 2008. And in 2008, 2009, the CLA adjustment was uh, around 110% because our assessed values were, were done before the, the Great Recession. And so the assessed values on all of our properties we're way above what the market was driving and the CLA takes that into account and adjust it down. That would be exactly what would happen if we uh, have assessed values today with a Johnson State College and tomorrow a Johnson State College is gone, the CLA would make that automatic adjustment, but it would be all on good data. Yeah, the CLA isn't the only game in town, however, you know, the state will, or for probate, the state will accept the value of the appraisal. Uh, it sets people's expectations, you know, they say it's, it's fair market value. Well, you know, in my trade, I know it's, it, you know, it, it's a value, it's a guesstimate from the town with all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, adjustments, and it may or may not be right, but people tend to, to treat it uh, as gospel and, and it affects the negotiating position of people. And I guess the same thing could be said of what it is today. That's right, which I agree is on, it, it, it's certainly going to be less equitable than what, we're, what our qualified people are going to come up with. Right. 
So again, I bring it back. Is there any board members who wish to put up the, uh, the stop sign on this going forward? If not, we would just let it continue. And I'm not hearing any. I certainly want to thank all of you, Jill, Ed, and Robin, for tuning in. Were you? Did you want them here for the part, the next part as well? Um, I think Jill is. I think we're all set with Jill. But okay. uh, if Ed and Robin can hang around for a minute. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, folks. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, planning for future reappraisals. Eric, before you start on that, yes. um, earlier you asked for the schedule. Are you interested in the dates that are set up for pre-grievance and grievance? Uh, if you've got them ballpark, I, I was just trying to gauge what timeline we were looking at. I mean, May is going to be a really busy month. That's when everything's going to go to the printer, be finalized and go to the printer, mm -hmm. then be mailed. Then we'll set up pre-grievance, which is the informal hearings, June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and then the following week, starting June 8th, 9th, and 10th, would be the actual grievance hearings. Okay. And I did speak to Rosemary about this months ago, because originally we were hoping for the room upstairs. Yep. Yeah, so. That may happen been on the you, never know. you never know if that'll happen yet. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that. Okay, Brian, you want to go ahead with the planning for future reappraisals? All right. So Nemrick has just completed our reappraisal uh, process as we've really gotten into the discussion here. Um, our contract is going to expire with them, and so we should start to think of, about our next contract um, and our next reappraisal. Like we've been discussing tonight, there's a lot of factors that are likely to enter into the next reappraisal. And I think it's prudent for us to be planning for that now. Uh, the other issue we have is um, the, the, they've told us that um, doing reappraisal in Johnson is especially difficult because for a community of our size, uh, we don't have zoning or controls, and they have had a hard time keeping track of um, new properties, improved properties, and everything else. Um, so uh, Ed and Robin, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say that, that Nemrick is asking if we would uh, adopt some kind of building permit. Um, I think that's appropriate for us us to discuss and uh, to discuss our goals with uh, uh, our next reappraisal uh, with them here tonight. So we can do that via just a regular ordinance, correct? I'm not sure on that. I'm gonna have to do a little bit more research. I've reached out to a couple towns about um, what they've done with similar work. I know that um, I think it was Rutland had adopted something similar. Robin, you were, were, had turned me on to the, the community. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm just not able to say for certain yet whether we can adopt something that's going to be comprehensive enough by ordinance or we'll have to go through a planning process with it first. Okay, and I guess I would like to hear from either Robin or Ed or both um, this is our first full cycle of the rolling reappraisal. Uh, this was a new concept. We'd never done it before here. Uh, obviously, it's a, a better budgeting uh, method for us. Do you guys have some thoughts on, aside from uh, not knowing when things are being put up and built in Johnson, uh, the whole rolling reappraisal process? I've, I've done a similar thing in, in Charlotte for the, for about 25 years. Uh, we've always done a you know a, a quadrant uh, during the course of a year, and then in the fifth year uh, we 
we put new schedules in place and basically do an update of all the values. And I will say that there were a couple of times in Charlotte that we never got to the fifth year. We had to do them in the second year or the third year because the values are growing up extremely high. This is back, you know, a few years ago, obviously. But we still maintain that process of going through, um, you know, approximately a quarter of the town each year. Sometimes you get more, sometimes you get less. But, you know, touching base with where things are at, finding your, your improvements, things you've missed out on before. So I, I and people do get used to it. Um, but in a place like Charlotte, where I've done that, they, I don't like, I'm not ex asking that you go to the same stringent planning and zoning and permit process that they have, which I think is exorbitant sometimes. But it's really difficult if you have to drive all the roads every year to try to find a deck. I mean, it just, it, it, it's impractical for us, us to do that. It takes a lot of time. Um, I'm not, you know, it, it, what, I'm not sure what we really gain from, a, from, from the impact that it just, it seems to be expensive and time consuming um, and a process that if we just knew where to go, um, we, we would get that process much quicker. Now I'll, I'll let Robin speak to that a little bit because she's done more of that in Johnson than I have. So I just like to say, regardless of whether we're doing reappraisal or not, your grand list needs to main, be maintained every year. So what happens in Johnson, in my office, is th in March, people are doing their taxes and they call for a house site certificate. I go into the file and all I have is a piece of land. Oh no, we built the house last October. It's off the beaten path. I don't know about that. So I have to leave what I'm doing and obviously go see that house to get value on it. Um, it's, it's been a very hard adjustment for me. I think it's um, just not, I don't think it's fair to the townspeople who are on the grand list to have a house, you know, and I have, um, found ways to find them, and that entails using highway cuts that Brian Krause si signs off on and driving around with those 30 approved cuts and to see if they're actually a house. Is it actually a driveway or is it a turnaround? You know, it's just the other, um, the other document I was able to obtain was wastewater permits that are recorded that people apply through the state. And again, it's a guessing game. So I'm going to take, you know, 30 of the highway cuts and maybe 20 of those <laughs> wastewater treatment or wastewater permits and go searching. And it's just, it, it just is not efficient. The other thing I'd like to say as the assessor in town, it's very unsafe for me to do that. And I hope you can respect my position on this. I am driving up a new driveway to put value on a house that I know is under construction. I'm going out there by myself. I do not have contact for these people because we have no permit in place. So I am blindly walking onto this property to look for any new construction. That's not a favorite thing for me to do. Yeah. <laughs> and people I mean, also get very upset when they, you know, when you come unannounced, but I really can't announce myself if I don't know for sure if, you know, I'm going to find something or not. And I try and do it by the roads around town rather than putting on a lot of miles in one day, I try and do one section of town as opposed to the other. And even having two people, there was times that Cassandra and I went out and it's, it's just not very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Robin, I uh, thank you for, for letting, us, letting us know that. And um, when it comes to your safety, um, you know, we want to hear that and, and take that very, very seriously. So um, that's definitely been heard. Yeah, and I would echo the same thing. Uh, obviously we gotta if we're gonna continue with this rolling reappraisal format 
we need to have some way of knowing when there's been uh, modifications or additions or what have you to properties. Yeah. So Brian, can you explore that, an ordinance method, if we're able to do that? Yeah, I, I hope that we can do it by ordinance and that we don't have to go through the whole process, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah, well, uh, it would not be much luck of a town-wide uh, zoning, I'm pretty sure of that. That's never gone anywhere. Well, just to, I mean, it's not even something that we could deny, just a, a, a notice that the, a building is being built or a, yeah. I don't know. Uh, the, the format that I'm investigating or that I'd suggest and I'd like to investigate would be um, no inspection, just a, um, if you apply for it, it's given, you know, you do whatever you want on your property, but you have to inform us that you're doing something on your property. And Mike, are you, Mike, were you trying to say something? Yeah, we had, you remember we had talked about that a while ago. Uh, yes. I think the problem uh, as far as people building something and nobody knowing about it is when, and, and it's true, when we lost our own appraisers, uh, at least one of the three, when we had a full contingency, knew what was going on around town because somebody had heard about something and somebody had heard about this and heard about that. And next thing you know, one of the appraisers, excuse me, one of the listers went and had a look and then they found out. But now we're at a disadvantage because we hire assessors who are not uh, familiar with our town. And let's face it, you know, uh, a lot of people try to pull something over on us and to try to build something and get away with it. Uh, it's just kind of the nature of the beast, I think. But uh, it's a good idea to explore what we we're just talking about is having a building permit and uh, at no charge. Yeah. They just have to come in and fill out a permit and it lets us know what's going on around town. And, and it also has to have a little bit of teeth to it too. That if yeah. you don't comply uh, with this building permit, you're gonna receive a fine. Uh, yeah. So let's face it. I mean, uh, we're living in different times and we don't have actual listers anymore. And so we have to resort to this. And the point is well taken about not being fair to the other taxpayers in our town when somebody builds something that has value and they're not paying taxes on it. So noted. Doug, do you add something? Oh, I was just going to point out that you need the teeth because otherwise it's, it's kind of like a dog that won't come back to the, to the whistle, you know? What's the problem? Why would they apply? Yeah. So yeah. we need that information pretty soon, Brian, because we're going into construction season. And if it's a regular ordinance, it'd have to be uh, what well, we would adopt it and it wouldn't be implemented for 60 days or whatever that timeline is. Yeah, there'd be a, a period of time. We have to have a hearing. Um, I will definitely have it before our next meeting. Okay, because we'll be at the end of the summer before it's enforceable. Yeah, so I will have a draft proposal for us at our next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Was there anything else for the future reappraisals? Discussion? Uh, I don't have a contract or anything to review yet for next year, but, um, you know, uh, Ed and Robin, I'm, I'm hoping that we can, uh, that you can put something before us that, you know, continues a rolling reappraisal while we work on uh, implementing building permits. I, I can try to find some, it, it, I'm, I'm not, being making excuse, I just happen to be extremely busy right now. Um, sure. And I, I know it doesn't answer your question, but I, I will try to find some time along the way here to try to pull something together. I, um, 
I'll work on it. I will work on it. When does our contract expire? End of June. The end of June? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I guess we better work on it. <laughs> Robin, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. As I told you before, if you ever feel uncomfortable, I would be more than happy to meet you at a location that you want to inspect. Well, see, that's the that's the dilemma with the way it's going there because I'm going out not knowing if I'm going to find something or not. Okay, I get you. But I'm just a phone call away. I mean, if you ever feel uh, threatened or anything like that, I'd be more than happy to show up. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> just be careful what you wish for, Robin. <laughs> I've actually, you know, made it a habit of when I do leave the office to do an inspection, I tell the girls where I'm going. And That's I do have Brian in my phone and I also have Brian Krause in my phone in case I am out there and, you know, uh-oh. Okay, good. And because put me most on the time if they aren't available. Right. <laughs> if or I if I talk to the property owner, I do not go out in fear at all. I expect to meet that person at two o'clock at that location. I'm fine with that. It's just going when, you know, when you don't have that appointment, you're going to see if there is something there. And then if there is, you have to stop and measure it and photograph it and take notes on the quality, the condition, the materials. So it takes a few minutes. Yeah. Yes. Well, if you're ever busy and you can't look at a location, you can always call me and I'll take a ride up there too and look around. Well, Scout you're a network employee. You, well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get you a tape measure is what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I have one in my car. <laughs> and I just want to say, Robin, uh, uh, you know, you've been a great asset to this community. When we lost well, we didn't lose her. She's still alive. Rose retired. Uh, you know, that was entering a whole new uh, world for us. And, uh, and it was an unknown world. And we weren't really looking forward to it. But uh, you've done a great job. And it's been a great pleasure having you here with us. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yes. And hopefully this ordinance will give you some, some you know, additional the, the additional support you need because that's what that's what we're here for great okay uh, i guess you guys are free to go but you're more than welcome to stay if you want <laughs> thank, you. Thank, uh, you. thank you for your questions i hope, hope we had a chance to answer some of them and um, we'll look forward to working with you in the future yeah thank you ed we thank certainly you. have appreciated this okay thank you good night Robin, good night, night. Good night. Good night. Uh, okay, the next one was a biggie on the what to do with the late tax uh, penalties. Yeah, based on Charles's confusion about uh, what we were calling our uh, tax notice, I followed up on that and did a little bit more investigation about the law that uh, relates to and enables our, that, that method we wanted to use to delay uh, the late penalty assessment. And that is not going to be applicable in our case. The notice that we're sending out, uh, we call it a tax notice, but it is uh, really a late penalty notice. Uh, which has a different statutory requirement. Um, it was, if, if anybody wants to look it up, it's uh, 32 VSA subsection 4792 is the enabling legislation for a uh, tax notification. And we can't assess penalties until 30 days after the notification. So penalties can't be assessed unless the notification goes out and there's no requirement for the notification to go out. What we're actually sending out though is referenced under 4793 and that is required to go out 15 days after the date has passed that was set at town meeting day. Um, 
So it has a different application and it will not enable us to delay uh, tax penalties like we had intended. Um, so we are back to solving the, the desired goal of uh, some penalty relief for those who have had a financial impact from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the strategy that's still available to us is uh, through abatement. Uh, okay. So out of the three strategies, the only one that really is uh, applicable is uh, the abatement hearing. Yes. Summer. <laughs> Well, it's still a way to help people who. Yeah, no, no, no. We, we can make it and I were talking, and what we think we can do uh, that might help people is we can make up something like a form for if you have COVID 19 related financial impact to the fourth quarter payment, fill out this particular form that we'll create. And then we, we can't approve them as a slate, but we can approve them relatively quickly, that these all meet guidelines and criteria that we've established. Um, and I th it would still require people to fill out a form and make a request, but it wouldn't be burdensome. It wouldn't be as burdensome. They wouldn't necessarily have to appear before us um, you know, we can do it relatively quickly. We won't have to take up a lot of anybody's time for that, but. And it's not automatic either. So in a way, this is actually not bad that there should be some level of burden on the taxpayer to, to seek this. We can make it available and make them aware of it, but they're, I mean, they should have some responsibility here as well to ask for it. I'm assuming this is not going to affect everybody who is currently delinquent. That would be my suggestion is that uh, you limit this to fourth quarter payments. Correct. Um, and then how much scrutiny you put on uh, individual cases is going to be up to the board. Of, yeah. you know, We've had repeat offenders for delinquent taxes for many years right, right. and they should not use the COVID-19 as any kind of an excuse for not taking care of their obligations. Yeah, I, my suggestion would be to set out folks that are current except for fourth quarter who claim uh, a financial impact from COVID-19 for again, just that fourth quarter period and that those should be very cut and dry. Um, if you want some additional investigation, that's up to the board. Um, I, when investigating this, I've received different levels of, I've received some different advice about it, but I think kind of reading the board's intent based on our prior conversations, I think the board wants to err on the side of being relatively gener generous to people who have a financial impact from here. So I think separating it into people who are, we'll, we'll yeah. I think that'll accomplish it. Just, if you're yeah. on, for, if you need fourth quarter, we'll talk about fourth quarter and we can do those pretty quickly. If you need other relief, if there's other things going on, you're gonna go through a more or less normal abatement request. Because I can envision this... problems from our upcoming tax sale whenever we have it. Yeah. This board can, can uh set up the form and then the the abatement board would be the one that would set whether it's a 30 day or a 60 day extension yes okay yeah the only, this board uh because that would the abatement will go before the bca so this board can't really weigh in on the specifics too much um, about individual cases or but, but this I, this board can give the direction for you and to uh, establish the form. Yes. What's the board's pleasure there? Go ahead. My thought is that uh, I understand the repeat offenders thing, but I think that the uh, 
the fourth quarter of the repeat offenders can be equally uh, affected by COVID-19. I don't know how you how you remove that causation from the fourth quarter payments. Maybe you ignore the first three, count the first three, but then how do you make them all uh, do? Doug, I, I do not believe that we can make that call. It would be the uh, the abatement board. Yeah, but aren't we going to aren't we going to be saying that uh, that the uh, having problems with we've got a form that said having a problem with uh, COVID nineteen is uh, in is effective, but we're going to deny this to people who are historically delinquent. No, people who are historically delinquent should apply. Anybody who needs abatement for any reason should apply for abatement. I'm suggesting that we create a simplified form for people that meet certain criteria, but everybody else will get a hearing. Well, everybody on both sides will get a hearing. We'll just have a stack of, uh, for lack of a better term, a stack of kind of simplified applications for hearing, and then a larger stack of cases that don't meet some particular criteria. And you can, at the, the abatement hearing, the Board of Civil Authority can vote for whatever they want on any particular case. Um, but I think that we can, I think that we can separate out at least some folks that we're pretty confident they're gonna meet particular criteria, again, being we don't, we can, we can include the uh, prior quarters or not. I'm suggesting that we don't include the prior quarters. We just have a kind of a simplified form for um, people who are current on their taxes until now and are applying for that because I, I suspect that those cases can be decided very quickly. And I think the other ones might warrant a little more discussion but everybody does deserve to be heard uh, if they request an abatement. I think this is a bureaucratic nightmare. What do you say? He thinks it's a bureaucratic nightmare. I know we want to do something. You know, last time we thought the, you know, the supposedly clear slam dunk was was clearly preferable to these and the other two seem not to be acceptable. Now we're going back to uh, to do something. We're going back to something we thought was unacceptable. Uh, I think the only one we thought was unacceptable was the special town meeting. I mean, I certainly didn't rule out this one as an option. I, I didn't like this one at all just because of the extra burden it put on people in a time that's already really hard. Mm -hmm. but. So is this, yeah, so is this really the the only option, Brian? Is that what you're saying? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, for me, if this is truly the only option, I, I, I agree with Doug. I mean, I don't think that we can discriminate at all. I mean, we don't know people's stories until, you know, you know, everybody's got a story and I don't think we should prejudge that based on history. I don't think that's my, that was not the point I was making. I'm talking about like the previous year's taxes that people were delinquent on and haven't paid. And those are the ones that if they don't settle up, it'll be coming for tax sale. Uh, so is the board saying that everybody should be? No, this would only be for this current year's Okay. Tax yeah, I, just, I'm talking about the previous year before any of this stuff happened. That, that I don't think that, that they should be in this mix. Yeah, and that, that would be outside of the COVID-19 window anyhow. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not trying to discriminate against anybody. Uh, 
because that, like you said, that was before this happened. I mean, if, if we make this well known to anyone who is delinquent and it's a very easy form to fill out, it shouldn't be a huge uh, obstacle for anybody to make this request. And I think they will make the request if they need it. We could put the form in the letter for the delinquent taxes. Yeah, exactly. Our first letter that goes out. How long does the uh, BCA process or the Board of Abatement process take? That, that could be very quick. Uh, we have to meet within so many days of a, an appeal and uh, we can make that decision right. I mean, these could be slam dunk quick decisions if they're pretty uh, standard. Well, let's make it easy. Yeah. Yeah, that's my thought with the form that Rosemary and I were discussing is to make it a, as simplified of a, of a process to request an abatement as possible. So does the board want to just give uh, uh, Brian and Rosemary the go ahead to develop the form and or do we want to review it again or review it? I don't think we should second guess either one of them. I think they do a good job, and I think that they have the the best interest of everybody. I, I think we let them go ahead with it. Tell the rest of the board. I'm fine with that. I was. Um, is there a way to have it? Um, uh, a way to have it available online to fill out online? Yeah, I can make a, a fillable form. Uh, I've converted one or two of our forms um, to that. I know the oven form you can is a fillable form. I can do that for this one too. Okay, great. Do you need a formal vote on that? I wouldn't think so. I, I don't think so. I think. Uh, okay. Let's say anybody objects, let them do it. Go forth then. Thank you. Revolving loan fund. So the state, and I think this is in your packet, um, the state has um, well, it's not showing up in my packet at least. The state is proposing a common application yeah. and guidelines for rapidly deploying local loans are we interested in participating? I think that's a great idea. So the we won't the the pitch for this is in revolving loan funds across the state. There's about ten million dollars that's unallocated currently. Um, some folks at ACCD are suggesting that, that they would be willing to develop a common application. Um, and they're going to try and simplify as much of the process as they can, do the underwriting for us. And so we would get, somebody would go to the state, to ACCD, and say, I want to apply for a grant under whatever this program name ends up being. Uh, they would get a grant. The suggestion right now is a $20,000 grant. The state would kick in. Um, if they're approved, the state would kick in an additional $5,000 for a, a, a grant, $20,000 loan. Then the state would identify affected communities. So it might not be a business that's in Johnson, but it would be a business that relates to Johnson in some way, something that has an effect on our community here. Uh, it could be to a greater or lesser degree, uh, depending on circumstance, but then that, once they've identified that applicant, they've identified some relevant communities, they're going to send that application to those relevant communities and those relevant communities will decide uh, whether they're going to approve that loan application or not. But it would simplify the process, we get more money out, uh, it would be, um, 
you know, we get some advertising with the state for our loan funds. So we have a little bit more exposure for, it, for that. Um, I think it's a pretty good system, but it would extend a little bit on our immediate goals of trying to loan this to Johnson businesses. Um, but I think at this moment, we've got enough money that we can afford. Do we determine when it goes out? We would. We can refuse any application they send us. If we don't intend to approve any application that comes from outside Johnson, um, we should probably let them know that, and we may or may not still participate in the in the program, but we are not deciding now that we would just, we're not giving blanket approval, we're not giving our review over to anybody else. Um, so we don't lose control of our money, it comes back to Johnson. It comes back to Johnson. Uh, okay. But yeah, part of the program is not a specific willingness, again, we're not pre-approving anybody, but would we consider a loan to, you know, if smugs came for a loan application, I said, you know, that affects Johnson, you know, we have people from Johnson going to smugs to work and for recreation and for everything else. Um, and they need, you know, I'm not sure Cambridge has a revolving loan fund or not, but at any rate, they, they need some additional funds. Mm -hmm. Is that something we'd consider or not? And if it's something that we just wouldn't consider, I'd recommend turning down participation. Plus. But I think we should consider that kind of thing, and I think we should, uh, I think we should participate in the program. By all means. Yeah. I like the simplification thing the best. Yeah. <laughs> um, Does anybody see a downside to this? Oh, I think it's a terrible idea. I think that we, there's a lot of, uh, there's a camel's nose under the tent, you know? I think you, uh, at the very least, you ought to see what's going to happen with uh, NVU and the need for the money in our community, you know? This is, uh, there, we, we certainly can think of, of we the state or we can think of we the community. Um, a, a simplified form is a very, very, you know, and $5,000 is, is uh, selling out our local businesses for, for a simplified form. I don't think so, Doug. We still have the ultimate authority whether we're gonna say yay or nay to it. Sure, you have, the, you have the ultimate authority, but are you gonna participate in good faith in the program and say, well, I think this St. Albans thing, or what, how much is good, uh, is a Waterville connection good enough? Or, you know, what, what, what's good enough? You, you know? have the ultimate authority. Yeah, I mean, what's wrong with participating? I don't think you should participate in something that, that, that has such a negative, potential negative impact of moving money out of our community. When, uh, and because then you're trapped in that, well, you're participating in what does participation buy as far as commitment and approval. We don't have to let it go if we don't think it's advantageous to us. Where's the grant money coming from? This five, five thousand. That will be funds that the state's taking in. That's not coming out of our. It's not coming out of ours. This also doesn't uh, supplant our normal current application process. This would be in addition to uh, our current application process. It's the same money, isn't it? It is. So we do have an ultimate cap on how much money we can loan out. And if we get lots of these applications, uh, it could tap us out for making other loans. It'll be like the Paycheck Protection Act, gone. <laughs> but we don't have to approve them if we don't feel it's in the best interest of Johnson. Well, you define to me what's in the best interest. Well, if it has Who to have a connection. Wouldn't, wouldn't the board decide that? If it must have a connection to Johnson, then it's got to be somewhere within our region for there to be a con connection. True, but we don't. We don't have to approve it. We're not no, giving away our money and letting somebody else give it out. What I'm saying is, uh, 
you know, there could be good reason why a business in Morrisville we might support because uh, it has some connection. Uh, well, uh, uh, Marvin's, we might want to support them because they have a connection here in Johnson. I mean, uh, I, I don't see a downside to this, really. Me neither. Money's paid back. How long does this go on for? This isn't indefinite. There, at this time, there is not a, an end date settlement. Um, there's nothing for us to sign up for or uh, commit to today because it's still very much in draft form. Um, but it would help the folks at ACCD if we gave, if we were able to express a an interest of yes, we like the sound of the program. We think we're interested, uh, but we would have another opportunity to review it before we had, were committed to it. Um, but they've got to, they've got to fund it themselves. So that they have to come up with enough money to pay out, you know, $5,000 grant for each applicant, which they, they don't currently have because this isn't an approved program. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, especially if this is a temporary program, which I would, I, you know, I think I'd like to see that five-year return. Um, we're getting the money back, though. We're losing, um, we're losing some in interest, though. Right now, interest rates are not anything, and the money's just kind of sitting there right now. We haven't. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No, sorry. Um, no, we haven't been very effective at getting that, getting it out the door. There's a requirement that we have to. What is it? Twenty-five percent that we need to loan out by a time that's probably already passed. So I think we have a lot to gain um, through this, especially with the five thousand dollar incentive for businesses. Go yeah. ahead, Carl. Yeah, no, I I agree. I I mean we don't have. I'm, what's the current? Do we have any more applications in, Brian? No. No. Yeah, and I honestly I haven't heard anything any businesses on Main Street that are are jumping at our loans even though it's low interest just because many of us don't dare take out a loan <laughs> we don't know if we can pay it back you know so um uh yeah i think i think we should ex i think we should explore this more at least let's see what they have to say i'm hearing a consensus of it exploring it and going forward to find out more information there's not a consensus for me i'd be opposed to it but i yes, think sir. that you people would go ahead you know that was the consensus i was reading was you were the only one opposed right okay so i'm going to give them a letter of interest that we're, we're interested in the program. I'll include Nat's concern that we have um, an expiration date on here at some point of how long are we expected to participate in this program. Um, you know, if they want it to continue longer than this immediate need, they're, they're going to have to kind of re-explain that to us and, and resubmit. But we're, we're interested in this for a limited period um, and uh, maybe include something about uh, what do they think about us committing a portion of our total loan fund rather than a blanket of our whole loan fund. Okay, well bring us back some more information. All right. Skate park maintenance. Okay, so the skate park. The skate park has a number of structures that need some maintenance. Uh, that's generally been hard to do because when the weather is nice enough to do maintenance on it, uh, people want to skate on it. Um, so the desire is to, to start committing uh, some of those maintenance and do the work. The skate park has, revenue, has enough revenue and enough funds to do the work. Uh, they have people willing to do the work. 
Um, but the current restrictions are limiting that. So how does the board feel about kind of giving a pre-approval to myself uh, to commit that work and to begin that work when um, enough restrictions are lifted that we can, we can do it. Too bad the place gets vandalized down there so much though, you know. You know I'm sorry, I'm so, so, sorry, uh, Mike, go ahead. No, it's just, has anybody ever been down there and looked around to see how they trash that place from time to time? Mm -hmm. It's really a shame. Oh. Carl, did you have something? No, I was just curious. Uh, I may have missed it. What specific work we're talking about, Brian? Uh, railings on a couple of the ramps and transitions from the kind of plywood up onto the shelf, whatever you call it, the, the top of the ramp. Uh -huh. are, are the ones that I'm aware of. Uh, we got a report from BLCT uh, with recommended changes that I'm, uh, Lisa is still on and uh, I'm not sure Casey has called in, but they might be a little more familiar with the specifics than I. Doesn't look like Casey's on, but Lisa is there. I'm here, I'm not that familiar with the, um, what they need done, I know she wants John to do the work um, and it's in her explanation he knows what needs to be done and he has the skill set and the tools to do the repairs and this is a good time because this stuff isn't being used. Would you be working alone Lisa? I believe so. Hmm. Be interested to hear what Scott has to say he's usually got a really good perspective on these sorts of things. If you're interested in chiming in Scott if not that's fine. Yeah um, I'm in the middle of a good game of cribbage with Kim. <laughs> so I, I got the general gist, but what was the specific question? I'm sorry. Basically, they're looking to do some maintenance down at the skate park because there's no skaters there. There's an opportunity. However, with the current restrictions we're in, uh, you can't do that kind of work. It's non-essential. If what Brian's looking for is approval from the board when things look like are easing up enough that that kind of work could be conducted and yet the skate park still will not be open to the public uh, just thoughts on from you on allowing that yeah it, it's, it seems like everything is revolving around the social distancing um, protocol when people are going back to work but I have you know it's outside and it's, you know, even if there was a second person, as long as they're doing social distancing, it should be fine. Um, you know, if they have their separate tools and there isn't a lot of, you know, transfer of shedded virus, yeah, I don't I think thought, it would be that big of a deal. Scott, I thought that I just read um, a couple of days ago that the governor lift said that construct outside construction you know, following the social distance rules is actually now allowed. It is now allowed. That's absolutely correct. Um, mm -hmm. And Lindsay's shop um, with a agency of commerce and whatever they call themselves now, community, whatever, ACCD, um, has a really good uh, sort of Q&A and fact sheet that they put out for businesses you know, that are working currently in businesses that are going to be coming online. And I sent that out um, this morning. And the, and the detail may be in there, but yeah, um, I don't think this is much different than allowing the community garden to work, you know, because you have people practicing good social distancing, not using the same tools. I don't see that much of a leap between a few people working on the skate park as long as they can you know, maintain good hygiene. Maybe if uh, Brian reviewed that document, the latest guidelines, we might be able to just let this go ahead and get started. 
Yeah, if it isn't allowed, I expect it to be allowed in the next round. Uh, this is, yeah, uh, I think pretty low risk. I think it's low risk. I would like to have two people there just because I like having two people when we're doing construction. I like having a, somebody else around. Um, you know, just anytime there's a decent chance of injury. Um, yeah, Brian, I would support you 100% on that logic. Um, having a lone construction person is always a little intimidating because if they get hurt, um, you know, somebody could bleed out and it's not necessarily a good thing. Loggers have been trying to do this solo work in the woods. And when you look at their workers' comp rate, I, I mean, I know it's dangerous work, but most of it's because they're on their own when they get hurt. Yeah. So yeah, uh, my inclination, I'd like to have two people, and like Scott said, two people working apart from each other, just two people in the area. Um, but yeah, we've got a list of tasks that have been recommended by our insurance company. Uh, they've been confirmed by the skate park committee. Um, and we just, I, I want to, as soon as we're allowed to uh, be able to put them to work. Brian? Go yeah. ahead, Lisa. I'm looking at that um, accd.vermont.gov, and as of today, um, it says that you can have those who exclusively or largely work outdoors, and then it goes on to say site work, exterior construction, skilled trades, public works, energy and utility work, mining, forestry, um, that they can go back to work as of today, and then it just gives a list of the restrictions, like two people per vehicle and six feet distance, they have to have a face mask, all that stuff, and that's effective April 20th, 2020. Great. Yeah. Perfect. That helps with our earlier conversation too with Brian Krause. Yeah, they mentioned public works in there, so that's really good to hear. Thank you, Lisa. Did I hear the interpretation that as long as there's not more than two people in a vehicle, that all of our highway could come back? Sounds that way. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the wording is public works in outdoor projects. So as long as they were outside and not doing work within the, the, uh, the garage. I'll forward this to you guys right now. It's probably what we got from Scott earlier, but yeah, please. Uh, so back to uh, the skate park. Eric, maybe. that is that is the same document I sent you guys this morning. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right. I figured it was. Okay. Um, well, the, does the board feel comfortable taking action on authorizing the maintenance at the skate park? Yeah, do you need a you need motion? Yes. I uh, move that we authorize the work in the skate park under the uh, ACCD guidelines. Perfect Amen. motion. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah, motion second. Any discussion? The only thing that we'll have to maybe be coordinated with the town is moving some of the, I don't know if some, that some of the trees that were put on those structures would have to be taken mm -hmm. away. Probably. Uh, we'll probably have to do a little bit of uh, assistance there to make sure that they can reach the, all the structures that they need to. Um, okay. Yep. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, do we want to circle yeah, back? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to circle back to uh, talking about public works with that new information? Eric, I'm gonna just interject real quick before I go. Casey okay. and Howard are on the line. They said that their phone couldn't be heard and they thank you all for getting this work moved through. I'll tell them we could hear them, we just ignored them. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, thank you. Uh, do we wanna circle back to the uh, public works department? Oh, sure. Put them back to work. Well, I think uh, if I remember our discussion on that, correctly, and do correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that 
kind of my, the way I took my marching orders for that was to um, bring it up to speed as quickly as possible with what we're permitted. Uh, so. And, and you were gonna learn more Wednesday, correct? I'll do my own review tomorrow, but yeah, I do have a scheduled call with uh, VLCT and VTrans on Wednesday. Okay, I mean, Two days is not really going to make much difference if you wanted to wait until Wednesday and, and get the bless bless. Maybe that would be. All right, boys. If the document's clear, I, I don't. I know that's sort of my impression of it. As long as they're not working in the garage painting trucks or something. Yeah, I, I don't need the league's bless bless. We can read that in plain English. But I, I agree with Brian. It was basically what get get them get them back to work as soon as we can based on the guidelines that we're hearing from the state. Yeah, yeah. Which it sounds like the guidelines may authorize it. So, Eric, if I can just chime in real quick, um, yes. the, the guidelines look pretty brilliant, except for the two people in, in the cab of one truck. Um, I would yeah. recommend strongly that that would not happen for a while. Yeah, I, I would agree with that too. And if they're in their own trucks, it, it shouldn't be an issue. The only problems would be they should not ride around in that double cab pickup truck. Yeah. Agreed. We have enough vehicles so they can get around. Good. I, I guess maybe uh, the suggestion to Brian Krause would be limit one person to a truck, a vehicle. <laughs> That's fine. Yep. Okay. So I uh, just keep running with that. Yep. Local emergency management plan. This now you didn't send out the updated one that we did today, did you? No, I've got it here though. So I'm going to do a screen share. We went. We went through this today with the uh, emergency management team. Basically, it's uh, just some tweaks from the previous, uh, no name changes, uh, some additions, but uh, you know our sheltering place is the same, our command center is the same, uh, the businesses in the community are the same. Like I said, it, it really is changing the date, basically. Uh, are you seeing any text in this? No. no. Oh, there we go. Yeah, no, that's not, not what it's supposed to be though. Uh, that's just, okay. Um, give me one moment. We're having some technical issues, but. Try this again. Whatever it is looks about one inch by two inches for me, which is how all everyone's pictures look like. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, so this has got the text in it. Um, so this is our local emergency management plan. Uh, the local emergency, emergency management plan is we complete updates to this every year. Um, and that's the old one. Yeah, this is our, our current one that is up at the end of this, uh, well, really, it's up at the end of April. Yeah, so, so you don't have an updated one that we could approve tonight? We, we need to approve it. Yeah, I don't have an updated one because my the updated one is the one that's showing blanks on every page. OK. Well, it, but I do, I can go through all the changes. Uh, Yes, if we went back to the top, I mean, uh, okay, obviously the date's gonna change to 2020, uh, down through everything stays the same. I would change Gordy to an emergency management deputy director and adding uh, Nat as a emergency management second deputy director. 
I want to start using them. That's more of how we use their roles than as a coordinator. We use them as a more like a deputy. If I was to be not available, then Gordy would be uh, the point person, the acting EMD. But scrolling down through it, all his contact would be the same. Brian's yours. So, oh, this is a primary contact, people? Yeah, this, these are our uh, points of contact. Okay. I don't know if you want to add yeah. Nat into that list or... I think we should if we're... I think it, with the designation as, you know, second deputy director, he should be a, a, also a point of contact. Right. Uh, so I think we would... Uh, assuming it's allowed, round up to uh, four uh, points of contact. Yeah. So then scroll down, and I'm not sure if this. Uh, this is just a list of requirements. Then we get into the next section. So these are our planners who have worked on this in the past. Uh, and that this year, uh, it the whole team was involved. Yeah, we have, we have a couple more people involved in it, but. Okay. Uh, we'll provide in this next section here, uh, added a heading for deputy director to describe uh, what that does and uh, remove EOC coordinator and add EOC plan. Um, Deputy Director Eric describes, you know, it's assist in general and, you know, it forms a chain of command. Do we want to have, like Brian just said, uh, Scott is a standing member as a planner. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty much going to take the EOC coordinator. Uh, I don't I, I think that's actually verbatim in the, in the new draft is EOC coordinator just becomes EOC planner. And then the deputy directors get kind of both the director line and the coordinator description. Uh, the potential EOC staff members, we add, we change Gordy's title, we add Nat as. Um, Second deputy director, and we had Scott as uh, EOC planner. I think that's the end of the changes. Um, yeah, everything else. The all the players stay the same for these uh, uh, department heads and stuff like that, right? And yep. contacts for Tatro. Um, though that list. That's so all I, I, the same, our equipment. And we went through this as well with uh, Meredith and Scott and uh, Gordy, and then uh, as well as Brian, myself, and Nat. And there is basically, I don't think there was any equipment change, right? No, there were no equipment changes at this time. We'll have the um, tractor, so next year we'll have equipment change. Uh, but we don't have it as of now, so currently no equipment changes. And our, uh, our public information warning system remains the same. The vulnerable populations are the same. Yep. Um, we know those are the same? What's that? Have we so the best of our knowledge, these are the same. Um, with yep. everything that's going on right now, it wouldn't surprise me if once we open back up, if they're not quite the same. Yeah. But as of when we close down, they're the same. But I'm not sure about Turtles and Tons. I think they might have closed permanently. Yeah, child care centers are having a hard time. Right? They seem to be dropping out. Yeah. I'll double check on turtles and tots, but otherwise I believe everything. To the best of our knowledge, was this was current when we um, 
you know, before the, the, everything goes down for yeah. the pandemic. Um, and this might warrant a uh, kind of addendum update before the next time it rolls around. Uh, to mm -hmm. Yeah, we can always update it more times than yeah. Uh, State e EOC, that's same. Northern Vermont University, same. Yeah, another uh, school. Might change, but as of right now, it's. Yeah. That was about it, wasn't it? Yeah. That's so it. Does, does this require full, and that's all the contact info for all board members and yep. department heads and et cetera. Uh, does this require full board approval or just the chair? Uh, it requires for full board approval, but I don't believe there's, I think it's just your signature. Okay. So with those changes identified, is the board comfortable in authorizing the chair to sign it? So moved, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I will second it, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Any other discussion? Um, Eric, I I've been meaning to communicate this to you, but I will while we're here. Um, I did reach out to the VSC twice about being an alternative warming shelter for this this year. Um, mm -hmm. And have not re they haven't gotten back to me at all. So okay. I don't know if you want me to continue pursuing. Um, I know that Greg Tetro said that he would offer up his, you know, place if we need it um, at this point. So just let me know what you want me to do moving forward. But the elementary schools definitely they are available. They are. Yeah. Yeah. They they've definitely said, and I think, I mean. The college campus is closed and they uh, are on a reserve for a hospital right. thing, I guess. But um, the way this thing is starting to taper off, I don't think we have a huge concern of any of that now. So we're probably fine. I, I would say we're fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you, though. Yeah. And Eric, I just wanted to um, let you know and everybody else on the board know there is no changes from yesterday's data for. Uh, infection rates or death rates Great. for today. So things are definitely, you know, knock on wood, leveling off a little bit. Perfect. So no new cases? No new, yeah, no new cases for today. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. All or in Johnson or Lamoille? It, for Lamoille. And there has been a request made to the state um, to get town based data. And I'm It'd not nice. sure how that's all going to fan out. There seemed to be a little reluctance, a little resistance, but we'll see. Yeah. Okay, is there any more discussion on approval of the 2020 LEMP? Hearing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Ayes have it. The mitigation grant. So that's not displaying either. Okay. Um, our mitigation, in addition to the local emergency management plan, which is updated every year, we also have a hazard mitigation plan, which is updated a little bit less frequently and is a little bit more involved in writing. Um, it looks at our possible exposures, likely scenarios, and goes into a great deal more to detail. Uh, it will be up in 2022. In the past, OCPC has helped us write that plan, uh, and OCPC is interested in helping us write that plan again. Uh, so we're right now, <clears throat> excuse me, we're right now seeking approval for the grant application for uh, the grant work to be completed during 2021 to update our plan <clears throat> for 2022. Um, it's a, it'll, the 
grant if approved will cover, I believe, 75% of the total expenses. It'll leave uh, you know, a few hundred dollars in maps, most, most of which will be made up by staff time on my part and uh, LCPC's part. So little, if any, cash out. It looks what to me doing? like a carbon copy from basically year to year. How much can change on this thing? I can't see much. I don't, ex I honestly don't expect there to be a huge change on it, but it, the expectation on this one is that we, we kind of write it over again. Uh, you know, that we do need to look at outside sources. We have, uh, MBI driving their trucks through, and that's just one example, but we would want to know what kind of materials regularly come through Johnson. Do we have a new, uh, you know, fuel delivery company in the area? Do we have somebody hauling some other kind of uh, uh, material that could be... To answer your first question, we still have Chittenden County's trash being yep. hauled through the middle of Johnson. But, but, it, it includes surveys and data gathering on other exposures that we might have so that we can have a not perfect knowledge, but a reasonable knowledge of scenarios that we should be prepared for. It's not going to cost us anything. The cost should be low, if any. Good. Um, you know, like I said, we're on the hook for a certain amount, but most of that, if not all of it, will be made up by uh, an in-kind contribution of my time and LCPC time. Right. So for tonight, you're looking for authorization to apply for this grant? Yes. What's the board's pleasure? Well, if we have to do it, we have to do it, but it looks pretty cut and dry to me. So move. We got a motion. Do we have a second? Someone going to, any seconds? Well, Mr. Chairman, we have to, we have to second this because this has to be done. I'll second. Are you, okay, we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Noise ordinance for the field days. All right, uh, the Long County Field Days has applied for their uh, noise waiver. Um, the dates might be changed uh, as we get a little bit closer to the summer, but um, as of right now, they're hoping that they'll be able to conduct everything on time. Uh, so I'd like the board's permission for either Eric or myself to sign the noise waiver. So what's the board's pleasure? Can approve it, approve it with conditions or deny? It's the same as it always has been, right? Yep. Okay. I move to approve. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Motion second, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? FEMA disaster. All right. Thank you. I gave most of this update before with, uh, during Brian Krause's uh, section where we were talking with the road foreman, but okay. the, the, the gist of it is, is that under the current circumstances, um, the funds released by the CARES Act uh, are not going to cover some of the expenses that we thought they were going to cover. Uh, we, you know, I think still acted properly, but um, yeah, the, they are for, they're only covering wages that are direct response to COVID-19 that were not planned for for another purpose. So if we redirect staff to cover COVID-19 related areas, that's not eligible for reimbursement. So my time for participating in COVID-19 related activities is not reimbursable uh, because it's part of my job.
job, my regular job. Uh, the employees that we're sending home is not eligible because we had planned on paying them anyway, even though we're now paying them to not do work. And even though they're not doing work because they are prohibited from doing work. Um, the only expenses they'll cover for wages are overtime hours. Uh, and it's overtime hours as an emergency response, not overtime hours to make up work that we were prohibited from doing. Uh, we are not eligible for applying for the payment protection program uh, at this time. So kind of, I, I've, I've exhausted a few areas, but I'm hoping that we will find uh, find another avenue or um, the next round of funding uh, will include some aid for municipalities. Uh, but as of right now, um, we're not in the hole because of this, but um, I at least had hoped that this would open up some funding that we could use to catch up uh, with work that hasn't been done uh, this spring. You know, that a lot of our mud abatement and other things have had to wait on us, and uh, that's going to be a lot of work that we need to do this summer. So, uh, going to work with Brian Krause about identifying um, and, and getting a handle on what's going to have to wait another year. What, what kind of maintenance can we defer? Um, we're just limited on time. We're, we're time and uh, the resources to pay overtime. I have a question. Yes. If we uh hadn't voted to pay these people and just laid them off, would it be compensable? Uh, not by us, but they would be collecting unemployment. And so we would, we'd be paying into that, uh, but. Well, you wouldn't be penalized for that. No, it would not affect our future uninsurance rate. That's water over the dam, but I was just curious how how fiscally prudent our it may have been morally and relationship uh, prudent, but how fiscally prudent it was our decision. And it may be that I it may be that when we are eligible, and I, I still have hold out hope that we there will be a program that's that's made available to us. Uh, we might be in a better position for qualifications to meet that future as of yet undetermined program. Um, so I, I'm not ready to second guess our decision yet, but um, yeah, it, it's, it has not gone the way that I would have hoped yet. Yeah, well, it hasn't been for any of us, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would have turned out better uh, with uh, unemployment, yeah. actually. Who knew that they would be such a bonanza in the unemployment realm? Really? Yeah. So we'll probably hear more on this you will. later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This Anyone have any ongoing concern? Anybody have any further questions on this? Um. Just a comment, if, if I may. Sure. <clears throat> On the second guessing, um, both boards' decision on doing what we did with our employees versus putting people on unemployment. Going into this, not really knowing what the infection rate was gonna be for our county and our, our staff, um, I think we still did the right thing because if somebody was infected, we had to get other staff back in pretty quick to backfill them being out sick. And when you have somebody on unemployment, it just seems like more hurdles you have to go through. And there's less of a seamless movement of staffing when you really need them. So I wouldn't second guess this too much. I think we did the appropriate thing, um, knowing how contagious this virus was. So just my thoughts. Yeah. Oh, don't get me wrong, I think we did the right thing too. 
Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Scott. I, I agree also. Good. And it, it, to Scott's point, all of our employees, when they're not on, are, uh, are on call. Uh, you know, that they are, are ready to come in in, in an emergency. Um, so it, it's, Yeah, uh, it, it's kind of the best we can do with the information we have. Um, and we're not done trying to fight for uh, some assistance recovery money yet either. So uh, I'm hoping that, I, I still hold, hold out hope that we'll make that up. Okay. Uh, 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 the next one. NVU update. I know Nat, Doug, and I sat through the whole painful thing. Uh, or no, I sat through until 6 30 and then I just shut it off. Uh, I guess Nat or Doug, you want to give your thoughts on what you observed? I thought that Jeb had a dog and pony show. I think that uh I wonder if the legislature is going to look at the idea, and I don't know where this would leave of uh, th that this is a single entity and to save the whole entity, you have to trash three quarters of it. Um, you know, maybe we split it into different entities and, and, and deal with them separately on a statewide level. Um, I, I think the solution is clearly in the legislature and it's not at the, uh, it's not at the trustee level. Nat? Um, yeah, we, it's definitely in the legislature. Um, the, the, the sense that I got from the trustees, especially, well, from the chancellor was that they're pretty dug in on, um, on their position to, to close through campuses. Um, and they're really, um, hanging on to that point of view. Um, the outpouring of support um, for NVU has, um, I think, been incredibly impressive and, and incredibly strong. And, and there's no doubt that legislators um, are, are noticing that and feeling the impact of that. And, and we need to continue to encourage that movement and that pressure for these next for these next seven days, um, we need to keep emailing. We need to keep calling. We need to to keep listening to 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 our legislators, Matt and Dan, particularly, have been really great at communicating with us. I know Richie's doing what he can as well. I haven't spoken with him recently. Um, I, it's unclear to me how they move forward with this chancellor in place. Um, he's so determined to stay on this course. So I, I don't know what, I, I, I can't see a way forward with, with Jeb's standing there. Um, and I don't know the logistics of him being removed or how possible that is. Um, so we can just do what we can do and support each other and, and support the community. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah, I think I would echo the same observations that you guys had. Uh, I would not just say removing Jeb would take care of the problem because no. watching the board members, it didn't look like there was a huge level of sympathy here or or it was already a now I shouldn't say no sympathy it was a predetermined outcome and they gave us a courtesy of you know our voicing our concerns um, from I've had discussions today with all three of our legislators uh, some of what they're saying is that we should be reaching out to every corner of the state with every friend and family and enemy that you may know and having them write to their legislators because the the legislators will listen to 
constituents in their own their own constituents. But uh, if you or I were to write to a legislator down in uh, you know Bennington, they don't put a lot of credibility in that. But if one of their residents is writing to them and saying, "Hey, you need to save these state colleges." And it's a huge upswell, and they are seen already, I guess, but it needs to be kept. They need to keep feeling it. Uh, I, I think the, the governor and the legislature have heard the message. Uh, I think it was very loud and clear. I was blown away with the what happened, thanks to uh, Mike and Kyle down here on Main Street, um, in direct violation of the governor's orders for congregating, we were out there, but we were maintaining social distancing. Um, it's a very strong message of this community. And I know Nat and I were uh, going back and forth during this uh, painful uh, observation of the trustee meeting. You think ours are painful, we're, we're, we're nothing compared to those guys. And uh, we were both watching the body language of Elaine Collins and she looked pretty uh, beaten down in the beginning, but as more and more of the testimony started coming in, and Johnson was very, very well represented, probably more so than the other two campuses. Um, you could see it uplifting her and just her face, and um, you know, I guess she's had a pretty rough time here. Uh, but it, this definitely is not over. And, and anybody who thinks that, uh, you know, the outcome's gonna be favorable, I would not, I wouldn't bet on it right now. I, I don't know which way this is gonna go, um, but I think they at least, they're hearing us and the legislature is hearing us. And I think there's a fortitude in the legislature now to fund the state colleges. Um, obviously something else is gonna give, but. I don't know. That's sort of my take on it. Yeah. I, I just clarify one thing. I uh, um, I mentioned Jeb, and and I don't mean to imply that he's the the problem. I think the problem is um, decades in the making with um, a whole lot of people who can be blamed. You know, um, a whole lot of people. So it's not his fault. I've just not seen a lot of vision there beyond his vision, and any any flexibility there. So that's what I'm that's what I'm saying when I mention him. But but did you sense that the trustees weren't? I mean, I didn't see any. Well, the only one I heard that come out against him was Elaine, in this whole plan. Yeah, I thought some of them asked some good questions. I thought yep. you know Lippert asked some some challenging questions. Um, there was the, the guy, uh, Dylan, I think is really listening mm -hmm. um, to the community. And I, I think there are others. It's hard to, it's hard to know. I mean, that it right. was, a, it was a uh, meeting started at one o'clock in the afternoon by the time we were talking to him. I mean, they were, they were still listening to people at seven o'clock. So, yeah. um, it's hard to know. It, it's hard to stay, um, focused on your zoom screen. So God knows what they what was going through anyone's yeah. mind. I need to keep working them. My sense is that the, the uh, trustees were concerned about their money, and uh, the so that's a matter of policy. I think they got a, a bad choice. I think they're discounting the harm that they're causing to their students, uh, to the high school students, to the students who would come, the students who are in in their in the, who are high school students and in, in, in taking courses, but and but when you get to a policy uh, or you're going to get to politics, it's going to be a question of the you know the first year is 25 million either way uh, for you know the transformation or staying the same, and uh, on top of the transformation cost, you have the agency of commerce and commercial development deal community development dealing with the hemorrhaging of these local communities you know there's 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 money more money coming from the state the state is responsible for all you know and the state is going to have to deal with us being decimated yeah that really felt like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing kind of situation of 
uh, and we experienced that at our Friday meeting with, uh, you know, where Lindsay, yeah, thank you. Uh, where Lindsay was learning about it just as we were, um, and yeah, that they're gonna the efforts that ACCD and other organizations are making to move people to Vermont um, wasn't taken into it, didn't feel like that was sufficiently taken into account. So, Stepping over a 20 to pick up a nickel. And if I could ask a quick question, and, and Doug, you might be able to answer this. Listening to the students um, talk about uncertain futures, somebody actually did the math and they're like, okay, so Castleton can get 400 students, but there's 2,000 students looking for a home now. Where does the balance go? And nobody had a good firm answer, even with moving a critical program from Linden <laughs> down to Castleton, there is no no understanding of what gets moved. So for the students who were, you know, right, rightfully so pretty emotional about it, being six or seven classes away from graduation or even starting out their freshman year, is there legal recourse for those families due to breach of service from the state? I, I don't have it. I don't have any idea. I think that uh, those students don't have don't have the leverage to get and the money to get something out of the system. Okay. Even if there was. Okay. I think that I think they're trashing. You know, the cracks for these people to fall through are huge, and they're going to push up against bureaucracies. We will take you, we won't take you. This is what it costs. We won't count these credits. You know, they can lobby all they want, but changes, you know, the, they may be putting uh, round pipes and or square pegs into round holes. You know, they're, they're clearly discounting the harm that they're going to cause. They're very sorry, they're acknowledging it, but it isn't, doesn't affect their decision making. Yeah, well, people have talked about it. This problem didn't start yesterday. This has been going on for 40 years, probably. Oh yeah, yeah. They some of them alluded to that. This has been going on for decades. Yeah. Or we got here over decades of underfunding. Well, I heard some comment about 40 years. I believe um, it's just a shame. Uh, you know, just like I said Sunday. It's not here, they'll go elsewhere and they may never come back. Well, we also, we also have a pandemic as an excuse, you know? That's a one in a hundred year, the last, you know, if it's like flood, flood events, you know, how often are you gonna have a pandemic? Pandemic, maybe they'll increase, maybe they won't. It seems to me that the government's response is just exactly opposite of uh, in the case of NVU and, and Vermont Tech than it is with regard to saving jobs on Main Street and stuff. That's the role of government to step in. Well, I put a call in to Cindy Lopper's uh, agent, uh, but I haven't heard back. And I'm going to do a follow up to see if I can get hold of her. <laughs> so, Mike, when you call those people, I actually went online to see if there's any famous people that got out of Johnson and there's quite a few, but the one that struck me ready for a drum roll on this Tom Cruise. Yeah. He, he, I don't know how long he was here, but yeah. I found I, that too. So when you talk to Cindy, give him a call, will you? <laughs> After I talk to uh, Cindy, you said, yes, please. Yeah, I will. If All I right. get hold of Cindy, I'll try to get hold of Tom. All right. I'll buy you a beer. Mike. <laughs> American one, not a foreign one. Uh, yeah. We'll talk. <laughs> Mike, you know, it was Lauren Philly that got um, Cindy here. And Lauren, I think, uh, became friendly with Cindy. So I, I think she might have a good chance yeah. of getting you good back in. Good point. Good point. I'll, I'll call her up tomorrow morning. Yep. You don't beat me to it. <laughs> no, you, it's all yours. Thank you. Cindy Lopper was Tycona's roommate in college. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to hear more about that. Yeah. Some other day. Okay. Uh, 
if we're all done with that, the only thing I might ask, Brian, you might give us uh, the board a full update on the dog bite and how that has come up, you know, how that's going. All right, so we were able to execute the order. Um, following executing the order, uh, I've spoken with uh, James and Harriet Armstrong a couple times. They've indicated that they want to file an appeal. Um, I have advised them, you know, you don't file an appeal with us, you file it with Superior Court. I suggested that they should consult an attorney um, before they file an appeal because they have to pay the, the court filing um, and it, they have to pay the court filing whether they make a good filing or not. So they should get a little bit of assistance with filling out the paperwork and doing everything there. Uh, they asked if I would refer them to an attorney and I, I declined uh, saying that it would be a conflict of interest for me to refer them to an attorney to file a case against the town. Um, and that's pretty much it. I had a little bit more conversation with them about uh, cleaning up the property. Um, and uh, I'm going to meet with Harriet next week. Uh, and we're gonna start talking about a plan on kind of laying out a process for progressive cleanup on the, the property. And we'll see how that goes. And we have to hold on to the dog for 30 days. Yes. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, until the appeal period is over, we're holding on to the dog at the Lamoille Kennel. Uh, when that is complete, uh, we will uh, you know, have the dog humanely destroyed. Uh, I think we do that with uh, Lamoille Valley Veterinary Service. Now, are we going to get caught in anything where because the courts are not operating right now, we have to keep that dog for a little longer? There's been no order that I'm aware of that delays the filing process. Good. Okay. Um, it may take us a little bit longer to get a hearing if he's granted a hearing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we could end up a little bit more consuming a little bit more time uh, but a judge could order a stay of of uh, euthanizing the dog. Yeah. Do you know if he's even filed yet? I don't. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of gave him what I knew and encouraged him to work with an attorney and work with the court that, uh, you know, I can help him a little bit with, you know, getting the phone. I, help, I gave him the phone number for the courthouse and stuff like that. But, you know, that it was improper for me to be directly involved in him filing an appeal. Getting back to the garbage, you said you talked to Harriet. Yes. Is anybody, how many people here have been to see that mess? I'm years. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, it, it would be thousands of dollars, I would think, in roll off fees to pick up all that trash. Uh, it's certainly something that they will. And if somebody, if people that don't have any money, how in the world are they going to pay for that? You, you can see it, observe it now from Route 15 before the leaves come out. Yeah, they cannot afford to clean it up all at once. Because all of it, a lot of it is just trash. They just pick up trash and bring it over there. It's what it looks like to me. That sounds like a health concern. What do you say? It sounds like a health concern. Yes, it does. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, they, they cannot afford to clean it up all at once. Never mind willingness or anything else. It, it, it will not be cleaned up rapidly. So I'm, I'm going to try, Harriet seems willing to talk about a progressive plan for getting cleaned up. I wonder if it looks like the state might help us when we get to the other side of this pandemic. At least they're answering emails. Yeah. I feel this way. If they would be willing 
to have it cleaned up, we ought to look into finding some way to pay for the cleanup. Well, yeah, that's an interesting, you know, I wonder if we could work with um, the Mile County Solid Waste Management District. You know, this is within their mission to help, you know, with the disposal of, of waste. Um, maybe they working with them or Philip Wilson, who's our representative to that board, um, maybe we could come up with some creative ideas to making it less expensive. If the will is there on the homeowner's part, I think that's the big thing. Yeah. Uh, we can try the moral solid waste. Um, I've tried, I'm going to continue to have some more conversations with the United Way about getting some assistance from them also. Good idea. Yeah, they're also overloaded with the COVID thing, but yeah. yeah. Good thought. It might be difficult just to, for them to part with that stuff just by loading it up with a bucket loader, you know, they, I would imagine that they would, they have some sort of bonding to that material and uh, it might be quite difficult. It will be. To get it out of there. It, it, it will be, they don't believe, they don't regard it as garbage. What would be the, if you can't do it, do we have another option? Is there a, is there a harder option rather than being kind and generous? We're losing you, Doug. Uh, I'm sorry. Can uh, you hear me now? I, I understood your question. Uh, it's, uh, do we have another option if they are not going to cooperate? Um, we have fines and that's, uh, we're going to do some investigation on their septic system. We've received a complaint that their septic system might be out of uh, compliance, but we we don't have a lot of avenue for forcing the change, but we're going to seek some additional assistance from the health department and, uh, and DEC for, you know, what can we do uh, to make change happen? that they are limited in their willingness to cooperate, uh, their view on what's garbage and what isn't, and their financial resources. Um, so it's a challenging situation. I, I, I think you'll spend 10 years on this and not move ahead an inch. Well, we've spent 10 years on it already and we've lost ground. What did, he, what did Doug say? He thinks we'll spend 10 years on it and not move it in. What's the alternative? I mean, there isn't. Just let people. Yeah. We have to do something um, because we just can't sit around and just go on. So, so what is the health department able to offer to us? You know, do they have any hammers? I don't think so, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm after him to just come here to Johnson and meet with us when we're able to meet and discuss a strategy because this throwing it back at us and we throw it back at them, that's not fixing anything. All right, well, we're not gonna solve it here. No, keep working on it. I'm hoping that we might be able to find um, an avenue to work with, uh, you know, with some uh, psychological assistance and some assistance for people suffering from hoarding. Um, that there might be an avenue there, but it's we, we need participation from them for anything we do. Uh, that we don't have anything other than civil fines. Uh, I don't think anywhere up and down the system, we don't have anything other than civil fines uh, as a stick. So we need some voluntary cooperation. There's a mouse in that kitchen. Hear it? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Oh God, more <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> What did you say? Bring a cat in? <laughs> what did you say, Kyle? 
I just said we have our own, sounds like we have our own issues. Yeah. Um, our own what? Issues. issues. Yeah. Just one last suggestion. Do they have, I mean, do they have that we know of any friend? I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of like who maybe could talk some sense into, you know, into them if there's, I don't know, maybe not. We're working on that, I think. Yeah. Okay. So has anyone got anything else they want to bring up? If not, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.